their invention was declared ready for combat. They went out and ran their charge into this beautiful new sloop of war, the Housatonic, and blew the stern off and sank it, but never came back. So the big mystery was what happened to the Hunley. From the moment it sank in 1864, the Confederate submarine Hunley has been both mysterious and enticing. Treasure hunters and maritime adventurers have long searched for clues about Hunley, the first submarine in history to sink an enemy ship. Finally, a team equipped with modern technology and a hefty bankroll set out to bring the sub to the surface. Join us for Raise the Hunley. It's dawn on August 8, 2000. Four miles off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, a diver is lowered into the choppy surf. He travels to the murky depths of the ocean, where the world's first successful submarine awaits its rescuers. 30 feet above him, reporters from around the world watch as a huge crane is moved into place. Along the harbor, men in Civil War uniforms wheel ceremonial cannons to the water's edge. All eyes are fixed on the horizon. I think that the Hunley is not only probably the greatest maritime find of this century, but I think it's probably the greatest find of the Civil War era. At 8.39, with hundreds of boats pulling in for a closer look, an iron object breaks through the waves. The Confederate Navy's long-lost secret weapon is exposed at last. This day is the culmination of a 30-year quest and the end of an age-old mystery that has captivated generations of Civil War historians and shipwreck fanatics. Since its mysterious disappearance in 1864, the Hunley's allure has never dimmed. In the 1870s, famed showman P.T. Barnum offered $100,000 to anyone who could find it. Over the next century, several intrepid divers tried to reclaim the elusive icon. All of them failed, until novelist Clive Cussler entered the picture. People, they think of a shipwreck as just, you know, some innate thing down or inert, you know, piece of junk on the bottom of the ocean. But how did it get there, and who, who died with it? That's the great mystery. Few sunken vessels provide as much mystery as the CSS Hunley. The Hunley is the first successful use of a submarine in warfare. This is a defining moment in, in world history, in the, in the area of military warfare. This is a turning point. Like many great inventions, the Hunley is born out of necessity. It is both a brilliant and outrageously flawed piece of work. A primitive iron submarine lit by a single candle, hot, cramped, and suffocating. It is propelled not by steam or motor, but by the sweat and desperation of its young crew. The story of why these pioneering men allowed themselves to become guinea pigs on such a risky enterprise and how their determination changed the course of naval warfare goes back to the early days of the Civil War. April 12, 1861. General Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard orders the bombing of Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The war between the states officially begins. The Confederate Army is driven by a deep thirst for independence, but the playing field is not level. The North boasts more men and artillery, and most importantly, a navy of 42 warships. President Abraham Lincoln is anxious to employ these boats to their full advantage. He orders the construction of 200 more warships and launches a naval blockade of the South. One of the early uh, descriptions of this was called the Anaconda Plan, was to uh, strangle the South, you know, kind of like a boa constrictor or an anaconda does, to surround the South and blockade its ports. But Confederate President Jefferson Davis is not so easily intimidated. He counters Lincoln's Anaconda Plan by calling for privateers. Privateering was a civilian-run business 
that would be hired by the government to go out and attack enemy vessels. And if you sank or captured an enemy vessel, you would get the value of that vessel, you'd get the value of its cargo. One privateer who answers President Davis's call is 38-year-old Horace L. Hunley. He was the Deputy Collector of Customs of New Orleans. He was also a planter, and so he was very well off. But not only was he the man who had the purse strings, he was also inclined to get down into the nuts and bolts and actually help work. In a machine shop in New Orleans, Horace Hunley joins two maritime engineers. During the summer of 1862, they begin work on a bizarre-looking contraption shaped like an overgrown porpoise. Gliding beneath the water, the iron craft is designed to sneak up on a blockade ship and ram it with a torpedo attached to a rope. They were starting to have some success with it and were very pleased, but the time was against them. When the federal forces came very early on and took over New Orleans, they had to move very quickly and sink the submarine on purpose. The inventors secretly flee to Mobile, Alabama, where they waste no time in constructing a second, larger submarine. To the men's dismay, this ship accidentally sinks while being towed across the harbor. But Hunley knows he is onto something big. By July 1863, he has already built a third sub, the largest and most advanced yet. Almost 40 feet long, the cigar-shaped boat is constructed to hold a nine-man crew. It will be this submarine that makes Horace Hunley and his team of inventors famous. 500 miles northeast in Charleston, South Carolina, General Beauregard is desperate for ways to liberate his war-torn city. He has heard about Hunley's incredible experiment. Beauregard's an engineer. He's aware of all these innovations. He's a man who's willing to try out ideas in order to bring about victory for the Confederacy. Lincoln's blockade is strangling Charleston, cutting off much-needed supplies from Europe, and the city is under heavy bombardment. Beauregard is willing to throw anything against the enemy fleet, even a precarious invention that has yet to prove its effectiveness. Beauregard requests that Hunley bring his ship to Charleston without delay. On August 7, 1863, the curious-looking object is put on a rail car and secretly makes its way to the Carolina coast. There, it will make history and ignite a mystery that is still unfolding to this day. Imagine sitting on shore in Charleston, South Carolina during a war, watching the Hunley sail off to sea. It never came back, so of course everyone had a mystery in their heads of what happened to it. On August 12, 1863, a strange vessel arrives at the train station in Charleston, South Carolina. A few curious onlookers watch as the bulky craft is carefully unloaded and quietly moved from the rail yard to a nearby dock. Recently, the Confederate Army has suffered a series of humiliating defeats. We've had the Battle of Gettysburg, so Lee's been defeated and fallen back into Virginia. In July of 63, Vicksburg had fallen, so things were getting more desperate. Uh, they need to look at ways to uh, help turn the tide in their favor. Confederate General Pierre Gustave Beauregard knows that in order to win the war, he must first break through the Union coastal blockade. All his hopes are pinned on this innovative and untested submarine as he orders it into immediate service. But Horace Hunley and his makeshift Alabama crew aren't ready to attack an enemy just yet. Plying the waters of the Cooper River east of the city, the nine-man crew conducts trial runs instead. These were young boys from the inland south who were not familiar with the water, so you were calling people from the back roads of Alabama to come to the ocean, and uh, it must have been a shock for them. By all accounts, duty on the Hunley is a formidable task. When your volunteers climbed on board the submarine for the first time, I'm sure just the size is so tiny. In height-wise, it's just over four feet. I'm sure the first reaction would have to be, is this really what I want to get on board? There are two small hatched doors, one in the front and one in back. They are the only ways in and out. 
The submarine was cramped enough that the men who were operating it were almost in a fetal position. If they got a cramp in their leg, they couldn't straighten it out to get rid of the cramp. It must have been a nasty place to be. The commanding officer takes his place at the front of the sub and lights a candle. This is the only source of light as he gives the signal to plunge beneath the water's surface. This feat is accomplished by flooding large tanks called ballast boxes, which are at both ends of the sub. The Hunley was designed to have a crew of nine men, eight of them working an interior system of cranks that will turn gears, that will turn the propeller. It was set up uh, that had fins. You could set the fins to dive, set the fins to come up. To remain undetected, the men practice only at night. Moving silently through the water, they are forced to rely on a rudimentary compass in order to navigate. If they want to see where they are, they pump the water out of the ballast boxes and glide to the surface. Whether General Beauregard is aware of the difficulties the crew faces is unknown. What is known is that after two weeks of nocturnal training, the Hunley still hasn't attempted an attack. The general's patience with the crew has reached a boiling point. On August 23rd, he abruptly disbands the team and sends Hunley and his crew packing. They are replaced with a Confederate Army unit, one that would follow Beauregard's orders to attack. After rushing through a handful of training exercises, the raw crew announces that it is ready to attack a Union blockade ship. Exactly what happens next is sketchy. According to eyewitness reports from men standing on the dock, it appears the submarine starts to flood while the men are boarding. The boat sinks almost immediately and the hatch slams shut. It catches one crew member by the leg. He somehow manages to free himself from the heavy door, but five of his comrades are not so lucky. The men are trapped inside. The sub becomes their coffin. Beauregard hires two divers to perform the grim task of retrieving the vessel from the bottom of the harbor. Due to rough seas, it takes a week. It's not exactly pleasant to be recovering the bodies. Um, the bodies actually had to be cut, uh, the limbs had to be cut to get them out of the submarine. Horrified at the recent turn of events, Horace Huntley asks Beauregard to let the original crew resume command, promising to launch an attack as soon as possible. Beauregard relents, allowing Huntley to have an overseer role, but places command of the ship under Army Lieutenant George Dixon, believed to be the man in this undocumented photo. He was very positive. He seemed to rally the men to believe that they could accomplish what they're planning to do to go out and strike at a Union ship with this new invention. One problem Dixon faces is the limited supply of oxygen in the sub. A snorkel system designed to let in fresh air does not work as planned. Once at sea, his men will have to survive on the stale and increasingly toxic air circulating in the compartment. One afternoon, Dixon decides to test exactly how much time his men will have before all breathable air is used up. With a large crowd of people watching, the Hunley crew intentionally plunges to the bottom of the frigid water. Everyone agreed that uh, when any one man felt that the air was no longer breathable, that that man could say, up, and they would all go up. There would be no shame in it. Uh, well, they went down, they lit a candle, and the candle went out uh, in about 30 minutes. They continued to sit there. They sat there for two hours, which is long after the candle had burned out, and by that time the air was getting incredibly bad. And when the first man set up, he was joined by everybody in the crew. The men quickly rise to the surface. The once crowded dock is now dark and abandoned. Everyone assumes that the crew of the Hunley has once again perished beneath the waves. The Confederate authorities had already told Beauregard the submarine has sank, everybody's got to be dead. So the next morning, Dixon had to rush over to uh, Charleston to assure Beauregard that they were all well and that they were just sort of testing the air in the submarine. 
Dixon now feels confident he can launch an attack before the weather turns bitter in early November. But he is unexpectedly called away on another mission. In his absence, Horace Hunley decides to take it out on one more trial run. Hunley decided, well, we need to practice. They go underneath another Confederate ship. The sailors on board are watching out of sheer curiosity. And they saw it go down. And a few minutes later, they saw bubbles come up. The submarine never came back up. For the second time, the luckless ship has to be dredged from the harbor floor. This time, General Beauregard is waiting on shore. As the hatch door is pried open, he is so revolted by the sight of the blackened corpses that he angrily dashes off a telegram to Lieutenant Dixon. I can have nothing more to do with that submarine boat. It is of more danger to those who use it than to the enemy. A few days later, the coffins of Hunley and his seven-man crew are taken to Magnolia Cemetery outside Charleston. A military funeral is conducted and a memorial erected. Across Charleston, Confederate spirits sink. The Union blockade is as secure as ever, and the nightly bombings of the city continue to make life unbearable. People no longer consider the Hunley Beauregard's great hope. Instead, they are calling it the murdering machine. In the midst of this gloom, Lieutenant Dixon returns to Charleston. He goes right to Beauregard's quarters and begs him to give the Hunley one last chance. Convinced that the sub sank as a result of human error, Dixon thinks it's still seaworthy. Dixon pled with the general and to let him raise a crew and go out and attack the enemy fleet. And Beauregard finally relented, uh, apparently telling Dixon that he could not attack submerged, but rather on the surface. Reluctantly, Dixon agrees to the new terms. He gets right to work. The interior of the sub is thoroughly scrubbed with soap and lime so that no trace of the previous crew's horrible end remains. Then Dixon sets out to assemble another team. To his surprise, he has no difficulties. This Confederate officer is standing there with 60 men. They said, you know the situation here. I'll turn my back and anybody that wishes to volunteer step forward one pace. See? He turned his back, turned around. He thought nobody stepped forward, but the whole 60 men had stepped forward. Choosing the best and bravest of the volunteers, Dixon throws them into intensive training. At long last, the rebels' great secret weapon is ready to launch an attack. It will be this next mission, the Hunley's last, that will earn her and her crew a place in the annals of history. The men gave their lives so that this thing would actually work. They were there, they knew the risks, they knew of the, of the previous deaths, yet they went out there again. It's the winter of 1864, and the city of Charleston, South Carolina, is enduring the third devastating year of a Union blockade. To try and break through enemy lines, the rebel army throws into action a bold, but thus far ill-fated contraption, a hand-cranked submarine. But time is running out for the Hunley crew. Lieutenant George A. Dixon knows he must attack a Union ship immediately or risk losing command of his sub. What he needs is a calm sea. On February 17th, after weeks of terrible winds and choppy waves, he gets it. Dixon chooses as his target the USS Housatonic, a 1,250-ton Federal warship anchored in the harbor. The Housatonic was a, was a fairly new ship. Uh, she was a sloop of war, very heavily armed. Uh, is one of the, the better ships in the Union Navy. The call to action begins at dusk as the nine-man crew walks down to the shores of Breach Inlet, a few miles northeast of Charleston. One after another, they climb into the icy hull of the Hunley. They quickly take their seats and prepare for their mission. I can't but imagine that it would have been a very somber experience to know that you were sitting in the seat of two to three people that had already died before you in this very submarine. They gather up whatever they plan to take, maybe good luck charms, pictures, journals with them. Who knows? And they leave the island at 7 p.m. 
and slowly make their way four miles out to their target, the USS Housatonic. About 25 minutes into the journey, a diminishing air supply snuffs the candle out, plunging the men into darkness. They know from their early experiences that they have another hour and a half before the oxygen in the craft is exhausted. They would have to come completely to the surface, open the hatches and try and get fresh air into the submarine. As you can imagine, it would be a pretty terrifying experience to operate that submarine, even knowing you were competent to do so. After about an hour of steady cranking, the exhausted crew reaches its target. It was a dark night. They were able to get quite close to the Housatonic before they were seen. At first, the Union sailors think the approaching object is nothing more than a porpoise or a floating log. But as it begins to charge their wooden ship, the men suddenly realize they are under attack. Battle stations are quickly manned, and cannons are fired into the pitch black water. But they have no effect. The Hunley is too close, and the heavy artillery can't be aimed low enough. At the command of Dixon, the Hunley rams the Housatonic, spearing a 90-pound torpedo of gunpowder into the underbelly of the ship. The effect of the explosion was absolutely devastating. It practically blew the stern of the Housatonic off. Five men died immediately. The boat sank in three minutes. According to one account, 45 minutes after the attack, a bright blue light, the agreed-upon signal, is beamed across the harbor to Confederate troops on shore. But the triumphant sub never returns. By the next day, it is clear that the CSS Hunley has gone down somewhere in the vast ocean. Confederate authorities know it's impossible to organize a recovery mission so close to enemy lines. The nine-man crew was officially listed as lost in action. We don't know what happened. Could have been damaged and could have sunk slowly. It could have been hit by Union vessels that were rushing to the aid of the Housatonic. It could have been swamped by the wake of some of these vessels. The Confederates have little time to dwell on the fate of their submarine because their dream for independence is crumbling all around them. On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrenders his army to federal forces at Appomattox, Virginia. The ravaged, war-weary nation tries to put the conflict behind it and move on. Over the next century, the lost ship begins to take on a mythological status among naval historians and shipwreck divers. One of them is underwater archaeologist Mark Newell. In 1972, he launches a grassroots effort to find the Hunley. I've always had a fascination with submarines and submariners, and that's what led me to search for the Hunley. The fact that those people and the courage uh, of those men then and the courage of submariners today uh, is remembered and recognized as a result of Hunley and the work he did. Newell starts by pouring through Civil War-era reports and maps, but to begin his hunt, he needs funding. This proves to be more difficult than he thought because few people believe that the submarine still exists. Most experts think the Hunley sank right along with the Housatonic, a theory which stems from the account of a Confederate lieutenant who worked with the Hunley and its crew. He expressed the opinion that it would have been so close to the ship that it would have been sucked into the hull. Uh, this report went into the records and everybody uh, accepted it. Newell instead turns his attention to the fact that the Hunley reportedly signaled its comrades on shore a full 45 minutes after the Housatonic sank. Eventually, Newell is able to hire a boat and a team of wreck divers. He realizes that if the Confederate sub did survive the sinking of the Housatonic, she could have gone down anywhere between the Union wreck and the Charleston coast a 100-square-mile area. Given the violent history of these waters, the dive team prepares for a long search. There were quite a few wrecks. I, I forgot the number, but I know it's in the hundreds of ships that they pulled out there for that blockade and sank during that time. Using simple metal detectors, 
Newell and his divers travel up and down the harbor in long rows, hoping to get a hit that resembles the Hunley. Every time a large object is detected, the team descends to the bottom of the murky water to investigate. A vacuum-like dredge will briefly sweep away the century of silt that surrounds the object. When a shipwreck is finally revealed, it's as if the men have stepped back in time. It's like looking through a history book, and as soon as you turn the page, the history it's gone. You can't go back and look at it again. So while you're down there, you try to take in everything you can. Over the next several years, the team searches tirelessly. Dozens of Civil War ships are documented, but the Hunley refuses to reveal itself. In 1979, frustrated and out of funding, Newell abandons his search. We simply couldn't raise the money at the time. And after that, other people attempted to find the Hunley. Our object was not to secure the, the fame for finding the Hunley for ourselves, but to ensure that it was found for posterity. One of these searchers is novelist Clive Cussler. Over the next 10 years, he will pick up where Mark Newell left off. He, too, is determined to find the Hunley at all costs. I was just obsessed that the Hunley had to be there, and by God, I was going to find it. In May 1980, novelist and amateur wreck diver Clive Cussler uses his own funds to hire a top-notch crew of divers in Charleston, South Carolina. His goal, like others before him, is to find and retrieve the remains of the elusive Civil War submarine, the CSS Hunley. It's all part of an obsession that consumes both his personal and professional life. Kussler is famous for writing a best-selling series of thrillers that follow a daring underwater archaeologist as he discovers hidden treasures. I was always intrigued by anything that's lost. If it's lost, I'll look for it. I used to tramp the, uh, the deserts in the Southwest looking for old lost gold mines, ghost towns, that sort of thing. And that more or less just sifted over into shipwrecks because that's one of the great mysteries. Unlike previous searches for the Hunley, Cussler's boat is armed with the latest in high-tech gadgetry, including a magnetometer which can detect metal objects on the ocean floor. After three failed expeditions, Cussler has grown disillusioned. He is no closer to finding the Hunley than when he started. But he decides to give it one more try. This time, he agrees to work with Mark Newell, who spent seven years looking for the Hunley in the 1970s. The two men are convinced that if they share their information, their stubborn target may finally reveal itself. Eventually, he agreed to come back and look in the areas we hadn't looked at, to check all of the old anomalies, but at the same time to look in all of the new areas. In July 1994, the largest and most sophisticated team to date sets out. Over nine days, the two crews scour the harbor. But as the quest heats up, distrust grows between Cussler and Newell. There is only one magnetometer and dozens of promising targets to explore. Tension grows after Cussler refuses to scan an object near the shore that Newell's divers say matches the contours of the Hunley. I think the idea behind a search is you go out and you hit all points. Even if, if, even if they don't seem quite possible, I mean, you're out there to do a job like that. You're out there to hit all the spots. Cussler's divers counter that they had explored the site on a previous search and that it was simply a boiler from a modern cargo ship. Quite frankly, we went and we knew what it was. We had dug it up. But he never asked us if we thought we knew what it was. By the end of the quest, the two teams are at odds, and the expedition is written off as an expensive failure. Once again, the CSS Hunley has eluded capture. But Cussler refuses to give up. You know, you just, you just get obsessed by things. Some people do, whatever it might be. And I was just obsessed that the Hunley had to be there. And by God, I was going to find it. Kostler rehires divers Ralph Wilbanks and Wes Hall and tells them to keep scanning the enormous harbor. 
he returns to his Colorado home, but asks to be updated every couple of days. In early May 1995, they resume their search. Guiding them is a map that highlights the most promising sites. There are nearly 100. On May the 3rd, we picked uh, target number one simply because it kind of was out away from some of the other stuff and kind of by itself. And uh, so we had to start somewhere, we start there. Because of its remote location, this site has never been properly explored before. It rests four miles from the shoreline and 1,000 feet out to sea from where the Housatonic sank. It seems highly unlikely that the sub would have traveled away from shore after it had attacked its prey. Still, Will Banks is determined to check every object that matches the general shape of the Hunley, regardless of how improbable. Shortly after 10 a.m., the men plunge into the cloudy water. Visibility is extremely bad. Fighting the rough current, they make their way down to the ocean floor 30 feet below. There, an enormous mound of earth rises up. Aiding the divers is a high-powered dredge. They zero it in on the towering dune. Under three feet of sediment, Will Banks begins to uncover a colossal, shell-encrusted metal object. Obviously had something that was a little bit different. Went down the side and found the forward cut water that goes uh, towards the bow, and then went down the port side and found the dive plane. Will Banks suddenly realizes that all these features can add up to only one thing. Their relentless search has come to an end. At last, the Hunley has been found. Once on shore, the elated divers celebrate by visiting Magnolia Cemetery, where Horace Hunley and his crew are buried. As the sun sets, they offer their fellow seamen a silent toast. Next, they make their way to the Charleston Museum, where a replica of the Hunley has long graced the courtyard. Only then does the magnitude of their discovery sink in. I was about 11 o'clock at night, I looked around, there wasn't anybody there, we went, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and we're the only people in the world that know that, you know? <laughs> Early the next morning, they call their benefactor with the news. And Ralph said, I guess we can't charge you for looking for the Hunley anymore. And I said, oh, are you giving up? And he said, no, we found it. And I was just, you know, I was numb. I couldn't believe it. And that's the interesting thing when you're looking for a shipwreck. The damn things are never where they're supposed to be. Given the great distance between the wreck of the Hunley and the Housatonic, Kustler begins to formulate a theory as to what may have happened. Slinking beneath the choppy water on a gloomy winter's night in 1864, Confederate Lieutenant George A. Dixon has just made history. He and his submarine crew rammed their deadly torpedo into the hull of the Housatonic. But now, the exhausted men no longer have the energy to crank themselves back to shore against the outgoing tide. Quietly, they surface for much needed air and wait for the current to change. As they do so, they drift further out to sea. The exposed submarine is now a safe distance from the quickly sinking Housatonic, but the men inside suddenly realize that they are not out of danger. A Union blockade ship, the Canandaigua, has seen the explosion and is racing in from the ocean to save the Federal sailors. Perhaps they were sitting there with hatches open, you know, for air, and, and it got swamped. If the hatches aren't locked, that might be an indication of what happened. So there again, it's, it's another mystery to be solved. Kussler acknowledges that this scenario is one of several that could have unfolded that chaotic night. Until the sub is examined up close, no one can prove or disprove any of them. August 8th, 2000. Five years after divers hired by novelist Clive Cussler discover the remains of the Hunley and her nine-man crew, 
the submarine is being reclaimed from the Charleston Harbor. Hundreds of Civil War reenactors who see the Hunley and its fallen crew as returning heroes line the harbor. There's a passion, an obsession that we don't want to forget the past. We can't forget where we came from. And these are our ancestors that fought and died in this war. Reenactor Keith Purdy has helped organize several elaborate salutes. Now, like the thousands of other spectators, he waits. Four miles out to sea, a diver enters a metal cage and is lowered into the surf. He will travel 30 feet below these rough seas, where workers have attached a series of cushioned slings to the fragile relic. One of the problems facing the raising of the Hunley itself is the fact there's no real interior supports in it. And then when they built it, it weighed about four tons. And having sat there for 136 years, they have to be extremely careful. If you've ever seen a rescued dolphin, it's in a sling, and it's brought up and recovered that way. That's what they're going to do this. They're treating this like a rescued whale dolphin porpoise, and will be pulled up all at once. At 8.30 AM, the cables begin to move. Although it took 13 decades to find the Hunley, it takes only nine minutes to raise her from her resting place. Hundreds of pleasure boats now crowd around the hovering sub, honking foghorns in celebration. Slowly, the Hunley is placed on a windswept barge and hosed down to keep it moist under the harsh Carolina sun. The barge makes its way inland. It passes Fort Sumter, where the Civil War began. The Hunley nears its new home, a 55-foot-long tank of water at the Charleston Naval Yard. It's a very large warehouse with a tank about the size of a very, very, very large backyard swimming pool. And it will be uh, chilled water. And the Hunley will go in there for about the next seven years. That's how long it will take for them to uh, reverse the corrosion on the outside and then find a way to get inside of it to look for the remains and to see the mechanics of how it worked. A great deal of speculation swirls around whether any remains of the nine crewmen will be found inside. If the hull of the submarine had been breached fairly early, then sediments would have got in there. Uh, those sediments absorb oxygen very quickly and you reach a state of stabilization that preserves tissue and bone and cloth. More likely to be found are the personal items the nine men had on them that long ago evening. You may find buttons, you might find liquor bottles, you might find uh, bits of uniforms, spy glasses, possibly paper, money, maps. For many, however, one item looms brightest of all, a simple keepsake worn around the neck of the Hunley's commanding officer, Lieutenant George Dixon. He was wounded at Shiloh, and in his pocket was a gold piece provided him by his fiancée, Queenie Bennett. And the ball at Shiloh that struck him in the leg hit that gold piece and apparently prevented the ball from severing arteries and killing him. But the raising of the Hunley may also help to solve some long-debated historical riddles. A preliminary investigation of the sub's exterior has already shed some light on its last few minutes. There is evidence there was firing at the Hunley. There are three holes in the sub, and one of the holes is about the size of a man's fist to a grapefruit in the Ford Conning Tower. That might have come from small arms fire. It may be years, if ever, before we know exactly how the CSS Hunley sank. In the meantime, experts debate its unique place in history. Well, I think the uniqueness of the Hunley submarine is its legacy. It speaks for itself in that it was the first submarine to sink an enemy ship in time of war, period. The ultimate legacy of the Hunley is with us right now as we speak. Uh, as we speak, great nuclear submarines are silently sweeping through the oceans of the world, keeping the peace. Those nuclear submarines are the direct descendants 
of Hunley and the work he did. But for many, it's not the historical record that's most important. It's simply that the CSS Hunley and its crew have finally come home. We have the nine sailors in the Hunley who had families, who had mothers and dads and sisters and brothers, and they went off to war, and once they died in the Hunley, there was no closure. I mean, they had no funeral. They had no burial plot. Should any remains of the Hunley crew be found inside, Purdy is planning one more somber event. We're going to do full military honors and bury them and give them a proper burial in the same plot where Horace Hunley and his crew and then the five members of the first Hunley that sunk are buried in the same spot. For those who will study and conserve the submarine, there are years, perhaps decades, of work ahead before the final chapter of the Hunley can be written. Marine historians continue searching for clues to help explain why Hunley sank. Clive Kessler put forth one theory that the sub was swamped by water as it was sitting on the surface with its hatches wide open. But the fact that the hatch doors were sealed from the inside blows that theory out of the water. The mystery of Hunley's doom and its crew's agonizing final moments may never be solved. To discover more about this and other topics, please visit our search engine at historychannel.com.